I'm Eric Potashnik, and it's my pleasure today to have our guest speaker, Jill Rudder, uh, from my Watts Institute at Brown University course uh, in the MBA program on public management and policy implementation. Uh, Jill is uh, visiting us from London today. She is a senior fellow at UK in the Changing Europe, at King's College London, and at the Institute for Government, which is a think tank that works to make UK government more effective. She works on a wide range of issues, including Brexit, uh, general uh, governance issues and policymaking. She appears frequently in the media uh, uh, on issues dealing with uh, Brexit, uh, administrative reform, um, and many other issues. She uh, formerly was a civil servant in the British government for, for a long time. She had roles, high level leadership roles in the treasury, the prime minister's office, in the Department of Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. Uh, I first had the pleasure of meeting Jill, I think it was 1987, if I'm remembering correctly. 88, 88. Um, in Berkeley, when she was a visiting Harkness Fellow, I, I was in public policy school there, and we were very fortunate to have a high-level British civil servant um, visit us and, and uh, spend time with us. So I thought about bringing Jill into my uh, remote learning class, uh, because we're focused on uh, policy making and administration and implementation and it's so important to have a cross-national perspective. So we'll be talking a, a bit about the British Civil Service and how that is similar and different from the United States, but the first question, Jill, is how are you doing uh, in the coronavirus? What's happening on your block? What's happening in London? Are you, I hope you're safe and what's been the policy response? So London is, uh, is a couple of weeks ahead of the rest of the UK at the moment. It's the epicenter of coronavirus in the UK in the same way I think as New York is the epicenter over in the US. Uh, that's partly because we're a globally connected city like New York, partly also I think because we have uh, population density and a lot of people use public transit and things like that. So I think the things that have made New York vulnerable as similar in London. At the moment, we have restrictions on what we can do. Uh, we are working from home. So nobody who does non-essential work is supposed to be working. Our restaurants, bars and cafes are only doing takeout. Uh, so you can't go sit in any of them. Uh, the prime minister was deemed to be giving slightly confusing messages in a week when he was trying to persuade people not to go but not shutting those down and finally they did that. Last week the UK Parliament just before it went off for a, a, a recess, it would have been going away for Easter anyway, Easter is a bigger thing here than it is in the US, uh, but it's taken an extra week, it's closed down, uh, but it passed a very big piece of legislation last week without any votes on it, which was uh, legislation to give the authorities really very sweeping emergency powers that they might need to handle a lot of the restrictions that are coming in and to take control of supply chains, uh, to do a lot of the things that they may need to do to respond to this crisis in sort of short, uh, short form. So that's where we are. Uh, last weekend was the first weekend when we've had decent weather in London for absolutely ages. Lots of people went out for walks, lots of complaints that people were not paying enough attention to the rules about social distancing. I went out this morning. It's a bit better here uh, this week. It's uh, 29th of March, I'm speaking to you on. Not such a nice day. The parks, I live right by some of the London's big central parks. Uh, parks, pretty empty but I was out there quite early and we just moved our hour forward uh, this weekend. So don't know how that's going. The Prime Minister is apparently writing to every British household. Uh, I'm not getting any post at the moment so I'm not sure I'll get that but anyway it's writing to every British household telling us that the worst is yet to come and that we may face uh, further restrictions particularly if we don't pay attention to the government's messaging on what we over here call social distancing. So keeping yeah. six feet apart from, uh, from people, except here we call it two meters. And, and what uh, are restrictions in place outside of London in more rural parts of the UK? Yeah, so what's really interesting is that London is ahead of the rest of the country on the speed of transmission and the case buildup. Around half the cases are in London. 
but uh, and we only have an eighth of the population, so we're well ahead. But actually, those restrictions are nationwide, not just in England, in Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland as well. And one of the governance things that's been really interesting about the government's response is we've had really tense relations between the governments of the UK, so Boris Johnson, Prime Minister, and his cabinet, which is also the government of England, because England doesn't have a government. We don't have a proper federal constitution like you do. Uh, Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland, that's been very tense over Brexit. But over the response to coronavirus, it's actually so far been amazingly unified. Um, and we've also, and also interesting in our system, seen some really constructive joint working between the government and opposition. We'd had a government that was elected and basically on Brexit, other big issue, was adopting a very sort of adversarial stance, was, you know, was very pleased. It was re-elected in December with a really big majority and saying, we're going to use that majority. We don't care what anyone else in Parliament thinks. We'll just you know, run everything through that we want. We don't care. We're not going to look at any changes you want in the legislation. They've adopted, because of this crisis, they've adopted a totally different attitude and been working really, you know, bringing the opposition in. So the, you know, Labour Party senior people saying, this is what we're proposing, what do you think? And uh, it's been really interesting. And what about um, Boris Johnson's health and how he's functioning? And what does this mean for, for your system of government? So that's very interesting. Uh, so. As of Friday, we heard that Boris Johnson, uh, the person in charge of our health department, the minister there, a guy called Matt Hancock, the equivalent of your Department of Health and uh, Human Services, and the chief medical officer, so the equivalent of the Surgeon General, had all, uh, had all got symptoms of coronavirus. Uh, they wouldn't normally be tested because the UK is running this line that we only test people who are in hospital. But Johnson and Hancock got tested because they are senior ministers, uh, so they tested positive. So Boris Johnson claims he is running the government from isolation in 10 Downing Street. Uh, Matt Hancock similarly is running uh, the health department from home. Uh, the chief medical officer is also self-isolating, so we've all been discovering that you can do a lot more business by video conference than we all expected. So they'll be relying on that. Uh, at the moment, we don't have an update on the Prime Minister's health. Uh, some of my colleagues who've had um, uh, what appear to be coronavirus symptoms say that it sort of hits them in waves and they certainly go through a period when they feel really lethargic. So very tired, sleeping all the time. So I'm not quite sure how the Prime Minister will really be managing to cope if it hits him like that. And he's in an age group where worse, uh, worse you know, symptoms are usually indicated than for the people I usually work with who are in their 20s. So. so do you have laws or norms? I mean, we hope very much the Prime Minister recovers, of course, but this is, this is serious business. What if he were to um, be suffering significantly from uh, serious uh, fatigue, inability to function at a high level, Brit Britain has a crisis, uh, there's a terrorist act, God forbid, or something else, what would be the mechanism to ensure effective uh, government uh, and leadership under those conditions in the UK? So we have nothing like your sort of prescribed order, if you like, your sort of, you know, call down uh, rotor of who steps up. What we've seen is that the, a guy called Dominic Raab, who is the Foreign Secretary, has also been given the title of First Secretary of State. And the assumption is that he's what they're calling, and this wasn't a phrase I'd heard before last weekend, that he's the Prime Minister's designated survivor, <laughs> but, uh, which is a great phrase. Um, but, and we do have a process of uh, appointing what they call nuclear deputies um, in case of a nuclear attack. And that's always been a bit of process there. What I think would happen is we have cabinet government. It's a totally different system to the US. Our uh, government is formed from the legislature. The prime minister is not elected separately from the rest of his government. It, basically, you need somebody who can command the confidence of, the, of parliament. So 
there might be a bit of jostling for position. We don't have a position of Deputy Prime Minister at the moment, nor a position of Acting Prime Minister or a provision for caretaker arrangements. So what you would probably see is somebody would emerge and if their colleagues were happy with that, uh, that would all go well. If their colleagues weren't too happy, we'd have some jostling for position and maybe somebody else would emerge. But, uh, but our system isn't dependent on the one person. So there would be other people and most of the powers actually vested in individual sections of state rather than in the prime minister himself. So the show will go on. And um, what's your sense about how the National Health Service is uh, going to be able to cope with this, with this crisis? We've read a lot in the United States about, um, frankly, how threadbare the NHS is, the need for more resources even before this crisis. Um, there were a lot of high level uh, reports about the need for much greater investment in the NHS in, in the UK. Um, what has been the response of the medical community there? So at the moment, the medical community is responding quite well, um, but there are various sort of pinch points emerging. So you're right as a general issue of funding. I mean, the UK spends a lot less on health than the U US does. I mean, we spend hugely less. And actually, that is something that we generally think our system is better at, that it's much more efficient. Uh, and unlike the US, we provide care to anyone who needs it. So we may ration care in the sense that there are treatments you would get in the US that you wouldn't get in the UK, but there's no means testing. So nobody, and nobody has to pay. Uh, so we, if you ask British people, what do they think is one of the best things about the UK, they will say the National Health Service. And one of the things that they least like about the US is the US healthcare system. So, and we would say that the fact that we have that universality actually puts us in a better place to cope with something like this than in the US. And we've all seen going viral that video of, I think a Congresswoman challenging over the costs of testing and things like that. Uh, you know, here, if you got a test, it would be free. Big question though about would you get a test? So I think you're right. One of the things that we've had is ever since the financial crisis way back in 2008, we've had successive years when governments have borne down on public spending. So, and while the NHS has been protected in real terms, the NHS usually assumes that it needs to do better than real terms. So better than just keeping pace with inflation to meet rising demand and the cost of technological innovation. So the NHS would usually say, we need to be two, three, four percent ahead of inflation to keep up with that demand, particularly with an aging population. Uh, they haven't had that. So on Friday, uh, Friday last week, the head of NHS England, this guy called Sir Simon Stevens, so he's a bureaucrat appointed to head that. It's a public agency, if you like said, yeah, we know we need more money in the NHS. We've been saying that for some time. One of the issues that are emerging are various pinch points in the NHS. The UK has a much lower ratio of intensive care units uh, to total beds than uh, other hospital systems, and certainly than to per head of population. So that's a potential stress point. At the moment, big efforts are underway to create new hospitals in conference centers to potentially house people who are ill if the existing healthcare facilities can't cope. There's also been big arguments about two other things that are emerging as pinch points in this crisis. One is around the lack of protective equipment for healthcare staff uh, and big inquests now and recriminations about why was this not stockpiled? There was apparently in a sort of dry run test exercise in 2016, which said they didn't have enough capacity. Nobody seems to have reacted to that. Uh, so lots of concerns that their staff are being asked to work in hospitals without the right kit. And the other thing that the government is getting continual pressure on and grief on is the fact that there are, is not nearly as much testing going on in the UK as in some other, particularly continental European countries or somewhere like South Korea, 
which seemed to manage the disease quite well in terms of the suppression strategy. Back on March 13th, the chief medical officer announced that we were stopping testing of people with symptoms. That was the move from the containment stage of the disease. So we basically, we were moving to only test people in hospitals. Crucially, we've only been testing sick people in hospitals, and that's really upset a lot of staff. Uh, at the moment, one of the restrictions is if you or a family member have symptoms, and remember the symptoms can look like regular flu at the start and things like that, you have to self-isolate for uh, up to 14 days. That's taking a lot of staff out of the health service. So there are reports that uh, absenteeism in the health service is running at say 20%. If you have a tightly manned health service as we do, then that puts a lot of burdens on the staff for turning up for work. So those are quite big issues. And there's a lot of discussion, I think, about the fact that whether what we call efficiency in good times means lack of resilience in bad times. Yes. And what about the economic response? We are clearly in or headed into a severe global recession with significant drop in, in economic output, uh, high unemployment, many businesses are struggling. The US and many other countries are, of course, providing um, uh, financial relief to businesses and families. It remains to be seen whether that will be adequate or enough. What's happening in the UK to try to maintain living standards and, um, and the economy? So one of the really odd things in the UK is if you hear government ministers defending the measures they've been putting in place, they are praying in aid Bernie Sanders, which for a Conservative government is quite a weird thing for them to be doing, because the Conservatives, you'd normally say, equate more to your Republicans than to your you know, most left-wing Democrats. So that's quite an oddity. So the Chancellor of the Exchequer, who is our equivalent of your Treasury Secretary, has announced successive packages to deal with coronavirus. And it's almost like one of those games of, you know, that sort of whack-a-mole game mm -hmm. where things, you know, pop up and you do that. So in his budget, you know, which is the normal time when we set our taxes for the next year, which was just, where, just back on 13 March, he announced a package worth 12 billion pounds to deal with the consequence of coronavirus. Mm. But that was before we moved into the strict lockdown, let's shut down the economy to deal with this phase. And there's always been a worry that if you don't provide enough financial support to people, people will go into work, they can't observe the sort of close downs and stuff like that. So since then, we've had a succession. We've had three new economic packages announced. One to give sort of loan guarantees to business. Then people said, well, loan guarantees aren't good enough. Uh, that also provided for people to, uh, businesses to be able to put their employees on what we call furlough, which isn't a very British word. We don't usually use that word, but we're furloughing people uh, on 80% of their pay picked up, the tab picked up by the government. Uh, but that then left a whole big uh, slew of workers not covered because one of the developments in the UK economy over the past you know, a decade, couple of decades has been the rise of what we call the gig economy. So people who do temporary work, casual work, you know, whether it's as Uber drivers or delivering food or a freelancers and stuff like that. So the Chancellor's last package on Friday, which took much longer to design, has been a support, a support package for those workers. And they don't even need to not be working to get to be eligible for that package. This is all potentially adding up to a massive amount on government borrowing yeah. in the course of the next year and to government debt. So we've had, since the financial crisis back in 2008, we've had a prolonged period trying to get the deficit down and to get you know, borrowing under control. The date in which we were sort of returned to surplus has always been moving to the right, so getting further away, being pushed back. Uh, the Chancellor has just basically taken us way back to the measures that we had to do. You know, the cost of this package could well exceed the cost of bailing out the banks in 2008. Oh, I would think, yeah. Um, 
Well, we hope that the UK, like other parts of the world, isn't hit too hard and that you stay safe uh, with, the, with the virus. But I want to shift gears now to a, a, a less um, topical subject, but one that is sort of in some ways more fundamental related to the British system of government. And that is if you could talk a little bit about the relationship between the British civil service and the ministers. You've spent some time in the United States. I think you, you have a pretty good sense of our system. How would you characterize um, uh, the, long, the long-standing similarities and differences between the relationship between civil servants and elected officials in the UK versus in the United States. So okay, so the key difference between the UK and the US is that in the UK, we pride ourselves on having what we call an impartial civil service that will one day be working, you know, so go back to 2010. Uh, one day they will be working for a Labour government run by Gordon Brown, who was the Prime Minister then. And then there was a slight delay because, uh, because we had to negotiate a coalition. Uh, the next day, those very same people are turning up and working for their new Conservative Liberal Democrat ministers. And no one would expect to lose their job and they would turn on a nine pin and say, hello, minister, we're here to serve you. We're here to serve the government of the day. We have very few political appointments. Uh, so in the entire of the UK civil service, um, there are ministers are allowed to appoint a hundred, under a hundred, what they call special advisors. Those are political appointees who don't go through fair and open competition, which is the way in which you're recruited into the UK civil service. So that is the theory of how we work, that ministers basically don't get a choice about who, they're, you know, who they pick from their civil service. They don't manage the recruitment of that. Uh, and they would be expected to work with the people running their departments, even though they were working for the same, for, you know, for a minister of a different political party the day before. That's great in terms of continuity, because it means the sort of things that we see when you change administration. British officials are always saying, you know, you can't believe, you know, you go and talk to the US Treasury and they've got no one in filling these top three levels because they're still waiting for people to be nominated, people to be confirmed and stuff like that. So we don't have any of that. Mm -hmm. um, but what you then do get is ministers, you know, being, a bit worried, you know, these guys have just been working for the, those people. You know, after all, the mindset of being a politician is very different from the mindset of being a civil servant. Right. You know, politicians you know, generally have strong political views. The one thing, if you become a UK civil servant, you have to realize is your political views do not matter. Mm -hmm. You didn't go through the bother of being elected and therefore your political views basically don't count. So you can have them at home, but you don't bring them to work. Right. So that's the key sort of difference. Um, and basically, that's I, the I, and that I should say before, um, I, I think part of that difference, um, do you agree, is just the structural difference. In a parliamentary system, there is the government of the day. There's essentially one principal to whom the civil service is responsive. In the US, with Congress and the executive, the separation of powers, there's always been a concern of elected officials that the civil service will be, the president's worried that they'll be responsive to Congress. Congress worries that it will be responsive to the White House. And it's that structural tension between the two branches that um, leads to great distrust in the ability of an apolitical civil service. Potentially, um, potentially that's right. Though one of the things that people here always note is how much better resourced your Congress is than our parliament. We actually do have civil servants also, a separate branch of the civil service that supports our parliamentarians, mm -hmm. and in particular in the committee work that they do, but also helping with parliamentary procedure. And that actually has been quite controversial recently when we've had tensions between the government and the legislature over Brexit. And we saw that a lot uh, when Theresa May was Prime Minister, and even when Boris Johnson became Prime Minister before he got his majority, that there are a lot of uh, uh, a lot of attempts by Parliament actually 
and by the legislature to seize control of legislation, which normally in the UK system is regarded more or less as the prerogative of the government, so uh, of the executive. So that was a sort of slight weirdness. Um, I think I that's a very interesting thing. I mean, I think presidents come in with their agenda. They, you know, we have, a, I mean, the one thing I would say that's very different about the UK system is I keep on talking about ministers. Mm. So we have a lot of ministers. So you, you and the US, you will probably know maybe the prime minister, maybe the name of the foreign secretary. You won't know many more, but they're around 20, 20 to 30 um, of our parliamentarians who sit in the cabinet. They have to sit in parliament. So they're not, you know, we don't just bring people in from all over the country like your US president does. But then below that, there are around another 80 uh, members of parliament, either members of the House of Commons or the House of Lords, who are also ministers. And uh, so we have a quite a thick political layer through that. And those are the people who are supposed to give direction to the political direction to the departments. And the department then, the civil servants then supposed to do what those ministers want done. So it's a, it's a very different system, which I think is intrinsically, as you say, because you know, our executive is created from the legislature rather than the separation, separation of powers. You know, we don't have separation of powers here. Uh, and we've seen a lot of problems when uh, the government hasn't felt it can control the legislature in the, say, in the way it expects. And that's when the problems with the minority government, and that was one of the big problems through the Brexit process, is that the government was trying, the executive was trying to act as though it was a majority and could command the legislature when it couldn't. It didn't have a majority for what it wanted to do. So in, in the US, if, if Americans or, or um, folks from outside the UK know anything about the British civil service, uh, you know, maybe it's through, uh, for those in my generation and older, through, you know, Yes Minister TV shows and things like that. But what's been striking of late is reading articles in the US press about high level resignations, of, of top civil servants, accusations of being bullied. Uh, so what is happening now? Is the system under strain? Is this due to Boris Johnson? Uh, what is the reason that we're seeing more conflict out in the open in the UK between civil servants and ministers? I mean, there's, there's always been a bit of an undercurrent of that. Um, you've always had some ministers who think that their civil servants have an agenda. It's always been a very long standing complaint about our home office, which I suppose equates over to Homeland Security, our interior ministry, if we're from a different country, um, that they have their own agenda. So there's always been a bit of a suspicion that some civil servants somewhere are trying to frustrate the government's agenda. And even under a sort of, you know, David Cameron, uh, prime minister, that, but not the last one, not, but uh, uh, two prime ministers go, you know, some of his ministers said, oh, civil service is trying to frustrate reform, and particularly reform of the civil service. So there's always been a slight undercurrent of tension. We don't get these people. They're foot dragging. Tony Blair, prime minister, back in the 1990s, 2000s, would say, you know, it's very difficult to reform the system. You know, I, I think he made a comment about, I have scars on my back for trying to reform the system. So there's always been a bit of that. But the thing that's really, really, really put the system under pressure is Brexit. Mm. Before, in the run up to the Brexit referendum, the civil service was used by the government. And remember, although the Conservative Party was neutral on Brexit, the government thought Brexit was a bad idea. And so the government was uh, campaigning against Brexit. The government used the civil service to put out analysis saying, Brexit will be a bit of an economic disaster area. Uh, and that was published uh, before that. There's been a lot of thought from the Brexiteers. Uh, so the people in the government, uh, particularly in the Conservative Party who support Brexit, that the civil service is trying to frustrate Brexit. As we said, they have very little evidence on that, um, but Brexit has caused problems. There've been repeated challenges to say the civil service is imposing its sort of Brexit on a very weak prime minister under Theresa May. 
So you might not have come across him, but a guy called Ollie Robbins was the Prime Minister's, was Theresa May's chief negotiator. And because it was easier for Conservative MPs to target him than to target the Prime Minister, their leader, they were saying, well, he is leading us into the wrong sort of Brexit. He, you know, the Prime Minister's his puppet. The Prime Minister went on the record uh, when talking to her party saying, you know, uh, I don't just do what Ollie Robbins tells me. That's sort of quite amazing. And then the most recent flare, then we had a thing in the summer, and I don't know whether any of your, uh, you noticed this when there were some leaks from a cable sent by the UK ambassador to the US. Yes. That said that Donald Trump's administration was a bit chaotic and not very well organized and uh, fraught with problems. I don't know why he was sending those in cables because you could frankly read that in the newspapers, but anyway, um, but those were leaked. We don't know quite how they got into the public domain. There's a leak inquiry and it's never told us how that got out. Uh, but then Boris Johnson, when he was running for prime minister was asked, will you stand by, this guy was called Sir Kim Darrick, will you stand by Kim Darrick? Will you stand behind him? Because the president was obviously kicking up that he didn't like uh, a UK ambassador saying that sort of stuff. And Boris Johnson refused to say he would back Kim Darrick, who then resigned. Mm -hmm. uh, so that was a very bad signal. Though I think people in the Foreign Office are now quite relieved that the newly appointed UK ambassador to the US is a career diplomat called Karen Pierce, who's been our uh, representative at the UN. And you know, they thought that they might parachute in a political appointee. Most of our ambassador appointments, almost all our ambassador appointments are career civil servants too unlike the US, doesn't go to who gave you a big donation in your presidential campaign or whatever. Um, so that was, that was basically seen as, uh, as undermining that. Uh, two things have happened since Boris Johnson became prime minister. One is that he brought in an advisor, so as his chief of staff, um, called Dominic Cummings. Dominic Cummings is a very controversial figure had form in thinking that the civil service was an appalling foot dragging, blocking reform, what he referred to as a blob. So basically got in the way of a minister and basically needed radical, radical shakeups and reform. Dominic Cummings came in and made it very clear that he still basically thinks civil service is pretty useless behind a lot of really poor decision making and you know, needs very, very drastic reform. And he certainly would like a much more US style system with direct appointments at the top of the civil service and get rid of what he regards as a whole bunch of dead wood. Um, so there are, so the, the, the thing you were referring to most recently, yeah. which is the most senior official in our home office or Department of Homeland Security, career civil servant, 33 years. I knew him from the treasury, resigning publicly so we've had breakdowns in the relationship before they usually dealt with sort of under the counter and then saying he's going to take the Home Secretary, so his most senior cabinet minister, to court for what we call constructive dismissal. So saying basically, you were so unreasonable to work for that you made my job impossible and we're going to drag this through the courts. And, he is, and one of the arguments apparently that led to a breakdown there was over the possible speed of implementation of the new immigration regime that the UK wants to bring in after Brexit. And one of the big concerns, I think, on civil servants is that ministers, they're politicians, most ministers have never run anything in their lives, um, just do not appreciate the realities of taking a program from a political statement through legislation but then actually into making a new system happen on the ground. Mm. And that if you point those things out, particularly in a very fraught, polarized environment where everything is seen through the lens of, are you loyal? Are you trying to frustrate Brexit? Whatever, that that becomes a position where you can't have a reasonable conversation. So, so what are the nature of the reform proposals? Is it uh, simply to reduce the scope of the civil service and increase the number of appointees. In the US, when we talk about uh, potential reforms of, of the civil service, sometimes 
There are proposals to make it easier to, uh, to hire and fire. Uh, there are proposals to try to make the bureaucracy, the civil service more representative of the American population, more demographically uh, 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 reflective of what our diverse population looks like. What are the kinds of ideas that are under discussion there for changing the civil service? So we've, we've got a few ideas going around. The civil service itself actually recognizes and actually has made great strides on diversity. We now doing far better with women at senior levels. Not so well, but there are attempts to uh, to do black and ethnic minority um, representation, what we call BAMEE, make that a bit better. The thing the civil service, I think, partly as a consequence of Brexit, has realised is it really has quite a problem uh, in social class. So you know we can have women and ethnic minorities, but they may be women and ethnic minorities who also you know, come from middle class, what we would call middle class backgrounds. That's different from what you call middle class backgrounds. What you call middle class, we call working class, but middle class, so upper middle class backgrounds, uh, who didn't just go to Oxford and Cambridge, so our elite universities and things like that. So the civil service has been making attempts on that. One of the things that I think we will definitely see, and there have been announcements made is more dispersal of the civil service around the UK and particularly to different parts of England. Uh, we used to have a network of government offices in what we call the regions, um, which was closed down by David Cameron. I think there are moves to create things. The Chancellor, so the Finan uh, Treasury Secretary in his um, budget announced that the Treasury would be creating a new economic campus in the North and that's designed to be more in touch with what's going on there because there's a bit of a sense that people were too surprised by the Brexit vote mm. that they didn't really understand the country. That's not confined to the civil service actually. It's been something a lot of our big media organizations based in London have been reflecting on that they did not see that vote coming and mm. they weren't appreciating what was going on. And, and so the move from Cummings is, is more about, I mean, he would like to see, I think, more hiring and firing, you're right, particularly more firing of people over bad decisions, things that don't work. And actually, I think, I actually think he's right on that. I mean, there's too little accountability in the British civil service, um, but it's partly because there's this very unclear division of labor between ministers and civil servants. I mean, I describe it as a bit of a Faustian pact between ministers and civil servants, that civil servants say, well, we won't tell you that your scheme is lunatic and undeliverable, uh, and you won't fire us when we fail to deliver your lunatic and undeliverable scheme. Mm. So I think, you know, if you actually want people to be taking proper personal accountability for delivery failure, you have to be more open to people saying up front, look, guys, that's just not going to work. So yeah. I think that's a really interesting development because the moment those sort of criticisms are aired in private, but not in public. And I think you would have to have something very different there, because otherwise I don't think you would have people taking on those responsibilities. Um, there's a bit of a bid by Dominic Cummings, but this is um, again going a bit with the flow to have more data scientists in, more people with project management expertise. There's always been seen to be that you know the UK civil service is stronger on policy making, as in as you know writing nice policy documents that are very well presented and make a bunch of sense and less good at what we call implementation, delivery, getting things done on the ground. So some of that. There was a very, very striking call just at New Year by Cummings on his personal blog, trying to recruit people to work with him in Downing Street, so in the Prime Minister's office, where he said, I want weirdos and misfits to come and apply. Yeah, so people with more diverse cognitive skills. Um, but one of the really interesting things about the Cummings agenda for reform is that it's so weak and unarticulated. So one of the things about Dominic Cummings, who is after all the Prime Minister's chief advisor, and you know, he is a brilliant political strategist. He pulled off Brexit. He was the uh, campaign director for Vote Leave. You know, he is the political strategist of you know, generations. I mean, he's fantastic. Uh, at that. No one thought that he could take vote leave to winning the referendum, and he did. Um, he pulled off an amazing election victory for the Prime Minister, which no one thought that uh, a, 
Boris Johnson running for a third conservative election victory could up his majority. That usually doesn't happen. So that was stunning. But he's a disruptor. He's much stronger on what he doesn't like than on what he does. And we've seen this on Brexit. So one of the things that was really, and that's really been the reason why the UK has made so little progress of Brexit since the vote, which was now nearly four years ago, yes, is that Dominic Cummings' insight, which was brilliant for winning the campaign, was that you could create enough people who agreed that they didn't like the EU to vote leave, and that's how you got 52% voting leave. But if you presented a picture of what vote leave looked like, so what that future relationship looked like, that coalition disappeared. So because that coalition is, consists of people who basically want to vote leave because they think the UK is fettered and prevented from playing its global role by being shackled to what they would call the corpse of the European Union. So we don't, you know, the future is in China, it's in Africa, it's in Latin America. So what the hell are we doing knocking around with these guys in Europe where there's no growth coming from, they're suffering from aging populations and they're all making a mess on the Euro, on migration. Why on earth are we bothering with them? Uh, we should be more open to the rest of the world. So that's the sort of global Britain side. And then the others are the people who are saying, we don't like Europe. It means we have to deal with all these foreigners and too many of them have come here. And we really like the way the UK used to be before we joined back in the 1950s and 1960s. And for God's sake, we won the war. What are we doing knocking around with all these European people? Didn't we win and they lose? Uh, or at least uh, some of them lost. So, um, and that sort of British exceptionalism and almost little Englander sort of mentality. Brexit's very much an English sort of nationalist phenomenon. Uh, so it's really quite interesting that that's a very difficult coalition to build. Mm. And the insight of the people running Vote Leave was you didn't try to build it. You just said, this is about the benefits of getting out. It's not about what the future relationship looks like. And that's one reason why Brexit has got so badly stuck because we just don't know what that future relationship was. That's what everybody have been trying to work out and construct a majority for over the last uh, last three years. So in, in some ways what you're saying is, I mean, it's a, it's a canonical example of implementation is, is not simply fulfilling a pre-existing policy, but it's a continuation of policy making because some of these fundamental choices have yet to be made. And even the political work of coalition building to, to build support for one vision or another of a post-Brexit uh, UK, that work still remains unfinished, it sounds like. So the position we now have, but it's very interesting how this is going to be impacted, this comes back to the sort of start with coronavirus. Uh, the position we have at the start is that finally, 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 because Boris Johnson won a majority in the British system, in December. He didn't actually get a majority of the votes. He won about 44% of the votes nationwide, but that's uh, in our electoral system, that's big enough to give him a very strong majority in parliament that is generally accepted. So he now has a majority to take through his vision of Brexit. His vision of Brexit is what in the past we've been calling a hard Brexit. It's a Brexit where we have a very loose relationship with the EU and for Great Britain, Northern Ireland's in a different position because of the uh, need to protect against creating a land border in the island of Ireland, something that the US Congress is very fussed about with the Good Friday Agreement and the peace process in Northern Ireland. But for the rest of Great Britain, he wants to be able to you know, move away from European regulation, strike new trade deals, including with the US, and that's the way he wants to go. The problem for Boris Johnson at the moment is he is supposed to be in the middle of negotiating these new relationships with the EU. The UK at the moment is in this odd transitional state. We left the European Union. We're no longer a member state uh, as of 31st January, but we're not yet completely outside. At the moment, we don't see any of that economic disruption because we're still in the European Union single market. We're still in their customs union. So we're still sort of part of that economic block of Europe. 
but his very radically different vision, A, needs some sort of agreement with the EU to happen uh, because of coronavirus, because the chief negotiator on the EU side, Michel Barnier, has COVID. The chief negotiator on the UK side, a political appointee, Boris Johnson brought in called David Frost, uh, has COVID symptoms. So they canceled the negotiation that's supposed to be happening last week. Uh, so we haven't had the second round of the negotiations happen. And nobody in Whitehall is working on this. So you're, this is going to be more protracted because of COVID. You're going to, will Britain remain in this limbo for even longer? It, this is very possible. So uh, there was a poll out at the weekend saying the public is moving, generally say you cannot fight COVID and yeah. negotiate Brexit simultaneously. That is just asking too much of government because it's not just negotiating, it's also getting ready. So just, uh, just a trivial example, lots of people in government who were working on Brexit have been redeployed into working on the COVID response, mm. which is taking up the whole of government. Mm. Uh, so these are two inordinately big tasks to be doing, whichever way you look at it, you know, to get ready for a radical break in our trading relationship with the EU, uh, to get ready for the borders, a new immigration system, all these things we need to put in place for Brexit. That's a massive task to get ready for that, not just in government, but also in business and elsewhere. So I'll just give you one trivial example. In order to deal with the new paperwork for transactions across uh, between uh, the UK and the EU, they said 50,000 people, it's quite a lot in the UK, 50,000 people would need to be trained as customs agents just to handle that new work. So not government people, but people to be hired on by the private sector. But at the moment, we're either shutting down companies because of COVID, saying that work's not essential, uh, or we're saying to them, can you please manufacture protective equipment or ventilators to mm. boost capacity in the NHS? The idea that people are all going to go and sign up for training courses to deal with customs paperwork at the moment is quite a long way down the list of priorities. So, but if that doesn't happen and we move to the sort of relationship Boris Johnson wants with the EU uh, at the end of the year, then we just aren't ready. So businesses won't be able to transact because they won't be able to you know, do the necessary documentation to get their goods over the border. Uh, so there's some really interesting things happening. You know, people need to be making job offers under the new migration system, but we haven't legislated for that yet. So it's, uh, so at some point people assume that the government and the EU will in a very low key way, just say, we've got to roll over that transition for another year, maybe two years. You can do that under the terms of the withdrawal agreement. If you do it by the 1st of July, if you don't do it by the 1st of July, it's much more complicated. And some people in the EU say you can't do it at all, but we will have to see what happens. Uh, so, but at the moment, the government is saying, no, uh, we're not going to do that. And indeed, one of the things they did when they brought back their withdrawal legislation in January was to say, actually, not only are we saying we're not going to do it, we're legislating to stop ourselves being tempted to do it. So they put into that legislation... Yeah. A, uh, a requirement that they did not agree to an extension uh, in, uh, in July, by the end of uh, June. So, it's, uh, so they'd have to legislate. One of the things, if you've got a majority of 80 though, as long as Parliament's sitting, mm. uh, so as long as MPs can find a way of functioning, if large numbers of them have gone down with COVID, which at the moment a lot of them are, uh, then, uh, then they can reverse that. But uh, it makes it a bit more high profile. Actually, on that point, this has been a, a do you have provision uh, for Parliament to vote remotely if many members can't come in? In the US, this is a big concern that Congress has not set up a system if, if, uh, if many uh, senators and members of, of the House are unable to travel to Washington. We don't really have procedures in place for this. Uh, nor do we, uh, nor do we. So that is a, that is a problem. Uh, but I do think people are sort of on the case with what they can do. So they've already changed the procedures for our select committees. So like your congressional committees, so that people can give evidence remotely and that members can dial in from wherever they are. But that's one reason why 
we've seen so many members of parliament going down with coronavirus because we deliberately construct, I don't know whether students have had a look at what parliament looks like ever seen prime minister's questions or an event, but our parliament was deliberately designed to not have enough seats for the members number of members there. So people don't even have individual desks. To be so honest, the time to I see it, it, looks like, it looks like a fire hazard. I mean, you have all of well, these- Well, that's the other thing that's supposed to be happening because the other thing that is supposed to be happening is this big project to do what they call R&R, &R, which isn't rest and recreation, it's restoral and renewal. Yeah. They are supposed, because parliament is basically sinking into the Thames. <laughs> uh, it's got massive sewage problems. Everybody was very worried at the fire at Notre Dame in Paris last year. Yeah. because Parliament has very ancient wiring and people are worried that it's a fire hazard, it's a sewage hazard, it's a health hazard, it has rats. So basically there was a plan that they were going to move out. Uh, the House of Lords was going to a big conference centre. They were repurposing one of the government departments that was supposed to be the new chamber of the House of Commons. And that was all supposed to be happening in the next few years. And they're going to spend billions on renewing Parliament. But uh, a lot of people are saying, actually, well, could this finally be a good move? Could this finally, finally be the thing that makes us look at some of our really archaic practices in Parliament and say, you know, cramming everybody through narrow division lobbies where they all have to physically walk through together is pretty stupid as a way of doing things. Can we not have something that allows people to press a button and vote? So we may see that. Finally, we might change something in the UK Parliament. Well, um, Jill, you've given uh, us a lot to think about. We could be talking for hours more, but um, I really appreciate your time in shedding light on some of the differences between the United States and the UK in the corona, uh, cor coronavirus response uh, and differences between the British civil service and the American bureaucracy, uh, as well as um, the current status of Brexit. Thank you so much for your time and, and it's been great chatting with you. You're welcome, that was fun.